Hello, sweet church. What a blessing it is to be back with you in our Calvary study. In session two of our study, I'd like for us to look at the scheming involved in the betrayal, the arrest, and the crucifixion of our Lord. I'd like to pray. Father God in heaven, we come to you with hungry hearts. We come to you at a heavy time in the time of uncertainty in this early spring season as we walk toward Calvary, as we search your scriptures with diligence and patience, as we listen to the sweet voice of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, to comfort us in this time, to teach us more of you and of your truth. And as we look today at the schemes of the devil and how you use the schemes of the devil to bring about righteousness and redemption, we praise you. May you bless your people. And Father, may you lead and guide us in spirit and truth. And it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. We find the first mention of schemes in the Bible actually occurring in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 14, we learn that Lucifer was scheming to occupy heaven, exalt himself to reign over others and to receive the glory and to be as God. We next see the devil in the Garden of Eden scheming to ruin mankind, to stop God's plan. Now, the Garden of Eden was a place where God had created mankind to live in harmony and in fellowship with him and to have dominion over all things, which included the devil. And sadly, Satan's schemes led to man sinning and falling out of the fellowship with God. Now, the guilt of sin belongs ultimately to man. However, it was Satan's scheme to destroy God's plan, his purpose, and his people. If he couldn't be God in heaven, he set out to be God on earth. Now the Lord curses the devil, and he promises the Messiah. And after this promise, the devil knew his time was limited, and he knew that God was going to send the Messiah, and the Messiah would crush his head and defeat all the evil schemes of the devil. So the devil set out to destroy God's plan, and he attacked the royal bloodline of the promised Savior. And throughout the Old Testament, the devil did his best or his worst to destroy the scarlet bloodline of Christ Jesus. And when Jesus is born, the devil works through wicked Herod to issue a satanic decree and to deliver a demonic death blow to many innocent children in a hellish attempt, ultimately, to kill Christ. In fact, the devil took note of every single prophecy in God's Word, either spoken or written, in regards to the Redeemer, as he attempted to scheme to control the ultimate death of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at Acts 2.23, just to see how much control the devil really had. It says, Him, that's Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So we see that God is the one who delivered over to these wicked hands now, obviously, God was in absolute control, as he always is. And the devil and his schemers were simply instruments in the hands of a holy God. Now, let's turn to Matthew 26, 3 and see what God's word says about the types of people that the devil often chooses to work his evil work. We see it says, Then assembled together the chief priest." and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Now, of all the people that we would think would scheme together with the devil to kill Christ, 
would be the chief priest. Now, these chief priests should have been leading the people back to God. And these scribes were teachers, so they should have been leading the people back to the scriptures. And the elders should have been leading the people in morality. But that's not what we find. We find the very people in leadership that should have been leading the people in the right ways, primarily to God and his word. And this law should have been based on the scriptures. But that's not what we find. Now, Caiaphas mentioned here was primarily a politician that served Rome instead of heaven, who had foolishly sold out for the luxuries of the palace. And yet in all of this scheming and selfishness, we see the divine hand of our great God completing his perfect plan in the work of redemption. Now let's look into John eleven forty nine 49 through 51. Let's look at what Caiaphas said. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all nor consider that is it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not and this spake he not of himself but being high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus should die for the, that nation now, the wayward high priest who is sold out to the devil and who is sold out to Rome preaches the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Caiaphas didn't preach the gospel out of a burdened, loving, reverent heart, but Caiaphas spoke the word of God unaware under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the devil... And even Caiaphas meant this for terrible evil. But God meant this for the ultimate good of his people. And when we look to Calvary, we see the epitome of the devil working evil to try to destroy God's plan and purpose in people. Yet we see how a loving God uses it to accomplish his perfect plan and the redemption of man's soul. Now we note the wicked council that planned to kill Jesus after the Passover. However, Jesus had other plans. Let's look at Matthew 26, 4 and 5. And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, now, the Passover week included the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the killing of the Paschal Lambs. Now, this scheming of evil meant that the men were going to target a specific time after the feast when it was safe to kill Jesus. Yet God had a predetermined and appointed time to be at the very time that these Paschal Lambs would be slaughtered in the temple, symbolic of the one and only Lamb of God that would be required to offer to man salvation. Now, God's plan, as it always is, was fulfilled in God's timing. Just as God had planned and just as Jesus had promised his disciples, we see this all come into fruition in a perfect way. Now let's shift to Judas, the schemer, the traitor. Now we all have a Judas in our natural flesh, in our hearts, and we need to be on guard against these powerful and deceitful tendencies that we all have. Now here we learn that Judas actually expedites the evil plan and the scheme of the wicked assembly so that it would be on time according to God's plan. We'll see his proactive betrayal without any man's prodding as we turn to Matthew 26, 14. 
it says one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest. Now it's unthinkable that one of the twelve privileged that would walk closest with Christ and be with Christ and see the testimony lived out of a perfect life and betray our Lord. It's unthinkable that not only would he betray Christ Jesus, but that he would proactively seek out the schemers that he might sell Christ Jesus for money. Now, there's a tremendous amount of guilt and shame that always comes with betrayal, especially for those who are closest to Jesus. Now, friend, you may have been betrayed by the very person that you should have been able to trust the most. Jesus understands. He's moved by your pain and your hurt. And he can comfort you because of what he did on Calvary's cross. Now, we must assume that these chief priests thought it was a great privilege and even a blessing that such a solution to their problem of wickedness would be presented so quickly and with so little effort. But we know once again, this was God's perfect way and perfect time. Let's look at Luke 22, 3. To Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Now let's look at John 13, 27 and Matthew 26, 15. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That that thou doest, do quickly. Now here we see that after they had sopped, they had had their meal, that Satan entered into the willing heart of Judas. And when that happens, Jesus turns to him, if you will, and I think he looked him right in the eyes and in his soul. And he said, you've already made up your mind what you're going to do. You're empowered with the scheme. You've given into it. And I, as God, as the Savior, I'm commanding to you that what you're going to do, you go and do quickly. This was God's time. And it said, and, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. The schemers must have been shocked that one who would walk so closely with Christ would sell him out so cheaply. It's a good place to ask some questions. What is the value of Jesus to you? What is the value that you place on the precious scarlet blood of Christ Jesus? And what is the price, the value that you would place on your redemption and eternal life? Now, the good news is our Lord cannot be purchased, nor can he be sold because he is God. He is king of kings. But praise God, he can give himself and did give himself on Calvary's cross that you and I, sinners lost with no hope, might receive him by his grace when we confess our sin and ask him to forgive us and to be our Lord and Master. Now Judas, the betrayer, even he knew that Jesus was innocent, as we see in Matthew 27, 4. Matthew 27, 4, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. Now Judas sold the Lord's innocent blood for gain of this world, just 
30 pieces of silver. And in reality, all the riches of the world equal zero, especially compared to the life of Christ. Let's look at Luke 22, 6, to look at this traitor making a covenant with the wicked. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. What an absolute conflict with truth when we see murderers and schemers, traitors, betrayers coming together to agree to covenant in a promise. The very ones that would scheme to kill God have the audacity to think that there's any truth in any promise or covenant that they can make. It's interesting to see that this betrayer, Judas, one that was being trained to be a disciple, is leading the lost people to Christ, but not to be saved, but to kill him and to take his precious life. He's leading them into condemnation. Because, see, we are saved by this innocent blood of Jesus Christ, and the lost sinner will be judged by this innocent blood of Christ. Now, what would be the reaction of these murderers when the betrayer comes and promises covenants with them to deliver Christ to death? Let's look to Mark 14, 11. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. What a sad thing it is to see that there would be anyone that would rejoice in betrayal and murder. But much of the world does this every single day, shedding innocent blood. Friend, we have clearly seen God's divine plan and power that takes the schemes of the devil, the world, and the flesh and supernaturally uses them for God's glory and man's salvation. So when we look to Calvary and we see all the scheming that the devil could come up with, the scheming of those who were close to Christ and the groups of people that betrayed God that should have been pointing people to God and His Word and all the wickedness that could be collected and assembled together for evil, God uses for His glory and for the redemption of mankind. What a great God. What a Savior. I pray you've enjoyed this today and may God just continue to bless you. I miss you and I love you and I hope you have a great day.